Good morning. All right. How is everybody doing today? I hope that all of us are doing great. Question, what is the best day? What is the best day in your life? Huh? Every day. The best day is today. Today. You know why? You know why? It is called a gift. <laughs> That is why it is called a present. Right? So every day is the most wonderful day. Because every, every morning when God uh, wakes us up, that is a wonderful blessing from God. So every day is a gift. That's why it is called a present. Amen? Good morning again. All right. <laughs> so this morning we are going to talk about paradigm shift paradigm shift about time okay. so first and foremost let us define what is paradigm shift according to my friends at cambridge a situation in which the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something changes completely. And according to my good friend, Miriam Webster, an important change that happens when the usual way of thinking about or doing something is replaced by a new and different way. And according to Masterclass, a radical change from previous prevailing attitudes that forms the basis of a new orthodoxy or a new way or set of belief. So this morning, we are going to study about paradigm shift, about time, about how we look at time, how we value time, and how we value ourselves. Now, the use of social media, it represents a paradigm shift um, in the way we communicate. It's streaming live on YouTube. You know, before we don't have YouTube. But now, most companies, most shows are now streaming live on YouTube. It represents also a paradigm shift in the way programs are shown. You know, TV stations, you know, they stream on YouTube so that they could capture all the viewing public that are not subscribed to any cable network. And worship services like this one. We are live on YouTube, right, Brother Rex? We are live on YouTube. So good morning to all that are watching uh, us right now in YouTube. And to those, our brethren, that are joining us in Zoom. That's a paradigm shift. Okay. Um, before, in our former way of life, in our former way of belief, when we shifted to Christ's doctrine, that's a paradigm shift. Right? So this morning, again, I'm going to call, or we're going to call our attention on how we view and treat time, a paradigm shift about time. According to Wikipedia, definition about time, a dimension in which events can be ordered from the past the present and the future, and also the measure of those durations of events and the intervals between them. So by the definition of time, we have two things that we can decipher from the definition. Number one, it talks about the order of things, the order of things as it happens, the past, the present, and the future. Now the second, it is the measure of this order, how we measure from the past to the present. And that is by hours, by minutes, by seconds, by days, by years, by weeks, and so on and so forth. So that is the basic or the general definition of what time is. In the Bible, there are actually, particularly in the New Testament, there are actually two uh, Greek terms in the New Testament that talks about time. 
And just briefly, it is called Kronos. The first one is Kronos. Okay. That is what everybody now is wearing, their watch. That's Kronos. Our clock time measured in seconds, minutes, hours, years, the past, the present, and the future. It talks about quantity, quantitative. Now, the other Greek form of the word time is kairos. Kairos, it measures moments, the right or the perfect moment, the opportune moment. It talks about an event in one's life. It is more of the quality, qualitative rather than quantitative. To give you an example of what kairos is, in Luke chapter 1, verse 20, and now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. This verse is talking about Zechariah, okay, who did not believe the news when God's angel revealed to him that his wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to a son. So the angel told Zechariah that he will not be able to speak. He will be mute for a time being until the miracle happened. And it did happen. And another example of Kairos is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So it talks about kairos. It talks about an event in time. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about time in a way where we have to put proper discernment about how we treat time. If you will read Ecclesiastes, particularly Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it talks about time. Okay. It is because it involves our destiny. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, thank you, Brother Alex, for reading the scriptures. He had made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he had set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God made from the beginning to the end. In other translations of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, it uses the word appropriate rather than the word beautiful, but both are actually the same. Now, let us dissect this verse for a while and see what it tells us. Number one, it says he had made everything. There is no denying the fact, my dear brethren and friends, that God, the triune God, made everything. God made everything, no doubt about it. Those who believe otherwise say that you know, this universe came from something. The question is, where did that something come from? And then they will tell you it comes from another something. Now, the next question is, where did that another something come from? So they will tell you it comes from another something. So it's a never ending question of where did that something from something from something comes from? All right, but God, being the sovereign that He is, He was not created. He was not created by anybody or by anything. If He was, He is not my God, and He is not your God, because our God is not created again by anything or by anybody. Okay. Now, Isaac Newton. I know you're very much familiar with Isaac Newton, a great a scientist and physicist. And um, I read a few of his uh, biography and interesting to note that uh, according to that biography, he is a Christian. He studied the Bible more than science. Interesting. And he made a lot of biblical studies. And uh, he once said, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And he goes on to say, in the absence of any other proof, the pump alone would convince me 
of God's existence. Amen. You see, God made everything. Now, the second, God made everything beautiful in its time. Again, in other translations, it says appropriate in its time. Everything that God created was beautiful. And everything happens. Everything that happens, happens just when it should happen, according to God's master plan. Okay? Nothing is by accident by God. Everything was well thought of. Everything was well planned by God. You know, you were born exactly the year and time God planned you to be born. So there is nothing accident with God. Now, since God created everything and planned everything, therefore, God holds the future for all of us. Although we have our own free will, right? We have our own free will to choose either to serve him or to serve him not. But the truth of the matter is we cannot escape the justice of God. We cannot escape the truth that each time, each event, each happening in man's life was all planned by God and set it for all of us to go through. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, let me just read to you, beginning uh, at verse 1 down to verse 8, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8, there is a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. There is time under heaven, and God planned everything. God talks about time in Ecclesiastes, in the essence of Kairos, an event that is bound to happen to each and every one of us. No matter what you do, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, and all of those who will be watching this, you cannot live forever in this earth. There will come a time in our life that we will cease to exist. According to Ecclesiastes, there's a time to be born and a time to die. There is a time, there is an event in every man's life that is bound to happen. Now clearly, God talks about the beginning and the end of life in Ecclesiastes. It was always known to man. Without even being religious, I would suggest that man knows in his heart that there is a time for his end. Because actually, God said so. There will come a time that death will come to each and every one of us. Now, a survey was made a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, 20% or 20 plus percent of Americans are afraid of dying, according to one survey. Now, according to one uh, website, verywellmind.com, 20 plus percent of Americans are afraid of dying. And these are the reasons why. These are the reasons why we are afraid of dying. And knowing this, we must have a paradigm shift, the way we think of life and the way we approach and think about death. Paradigm shift, the fang of death. These are some of the reasons why we are afraid and are scared of dying. Number one, fear of pain and suffering. 
The fear of experiencing excruciating pain and suffering leading to death, like cancer and other terminal illnesses. Fear of the unknown. What is there after dying? No one in human history has survived to tell us what really happens after we take our last breath. You know, I find it really interesting, my dear brethren, to see over the internet people claiming to have been to heaven, have seen God and talked to God. And then all of a sudden, they are back here on earth. What an unfortunate moment. You are actually there in heaven. So why are you back down here with us? You are actually with God. Now, why are you back here with us suffering? I don't get it. I was sent back by God to tell you that there is God. The Bible tells us that there is God. I don't need someone telling me he came from God and then went back here and tell me there is God. The Bible already tells me that. Fear of the unknown. Fear of non-existence. Many people fear the idea that they will completely cease to exist after death occurs. Fear of eternal punishment. Many people, regardless of their religious persuasion or lack of spiritual beliefs, fear that they will be punished for what they did or did not do while here on earth. Fear of loss of control. Human nature generally seeks to control the situations we encounter, but that remains something over which we have absolutely no control. For this reason, a man feared death. Fear of what will become of our loved ones. The worry of what will happen to our family if we die. Now, ironically, with all these fears, reason about dying, it seems like we don't care all about our life. People fear of dying. They fear about death. But if you're going to look at how we live, of how people live, it seems like they don't care at all. The worst is we don't care about God. When a person doesn't care about God, he doesn't really care about himself. These fears of ours should wake us up to that kairos, to that moment in time in man's life that soon your life, my life, will cease to exist. That moment in time when God sets a limit for all of us. Now, it is a high time, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, for a paradigm shift. Those that have not come into Christ Jesus to understand God's will. Now, the reason for pain and suffering, you know, all of us, we don't want to go through that pain, of course. But if we know the doctrine of God, we know that we can never escape pain. Nobody here is exempted from pain. Even how faithful you are, you will experience pain. Jesus said that there will be sufferings and pain. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now they say they, they fear that because fear of the unknown. If we will just listen to God, we will not fear the unknown. You will not fear the unknown. If you will set your hearts upon God, to God's message, you don't have to fear the unknown. God made it clear, you know, what is there to expect in the afterlife if we are faithful to him. And now the prize awaits me. And what is that prize? The crown of righteousness. God made it known to all of us. So why do you have to fear the unknown? which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to this happening. With God, there is nothing unknown. Remember that he is sovereign. He created everything. God made it known to all of us what is there to know. 
They say they fear death because fear of non-existence and fear of eternal punishment. If we have God in our lives, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, we don't have to fear all of those things. We don't have to fear eternal punishment. The Bible is very clear about this. Therefore, there is no condemnation. To whom? To those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, if you are faithful, why do you have to fear eternal punishment? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. If you walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, or not of the devil, you don't have to fear eternal punishment. Now they say they fear that because of fear of what will become of our loved ones. You know that it is our responsibility. It is your responsibility to know God. It is my responsibility to know God in the first place. It is our duty, as the Bible puts it, to know God. If we have God in our lives, it is also our duty, our mandate, to make sure that our loved ones will also have Jesus Christ in their lives. In so doing, then, my dear brethren and friends, we don't have to fear of what will become of our loved ones. If you know that you are in Christ, and if you give them what you have, if you give them Christ, if you die, you don't have to worry about them because you know that they have Christ as well. What is there to fear when you have Christ? Right? And when they have Christ, there is no fear, but there is joy. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep, obey his commandments. For this is my duty. For this is your duty. The duty of all mankind. And it is your duty to share Christ to your family. First Thessalonians chapter 2, 7 and 8. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you. We love you so much. We were delighted to what? To share with you what? Not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. If we truly love our loved ones, my dear brothers and sisters, if we truly love them, we will share them the gospel of God. It says they're like a nursing mother that will care for his children. You know, by truly living out what the gospel teaches us, being seen and being felt by other people. You know, the, the generosity, the forgiveness, you know, the love, the comfort that we are showing to our fellow, they will see that you have truly embraced the gospel and you have truly embraced Jesus Christ in your life. And this is what Apostle meant when he said, when he said that we share not only the gospel, but we are sharing our lives with you because we embody the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, finally, it says fear of loss of control. People are afraid of dying because they fear of loss of control. You know, we, we will totally lose control of our life if we will try to control it by ourselves. You will definitely lose control of your life. If we will lean on in our own understanding, if we will lean on to our own will, we will terribly suffer. But if we will surrender our life to him and let God control our life, the Lord will direct the steps of the, of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. It is not Proverbs 37, but it is Psalm 37. Thank you, Brother Rex, for correcting me. That is Psalm 37. Again, my keyboard made a mistake. So I will have again changed my keyboard for the second time. So the Lord directs the steps of the godly. So why do you need to control yourself when you can give your life to God and let God control your life? So you don't have to fear losing control of your life. 
Jeremiah 29:11. Wow. The Lord has a wonderful plan for you. For I know the plans I have for you. Do you even have a plan for yourself? God have a plan for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And look at God has, you know, look at what God has in store for you and me. God has a wonderful plans for all of us, you see. Now, why do you have to suffer eternally if you can live a joyful life eternally with God? Now, these truths, these are not hidden to us. These are written in the Bible so that we can learn. We can have that paradigm shift. We can have that new thinking of time. And God made this known to all of us. He has also put eternity in their hearts. Now, King Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, understood that man has an awareness and a longing for the eternal and the sense of divine purpose in him, being created by God, being created in the image and likeness of God. Now, this stems again from the fact that you and I were the very image and likeness of God. But though God has given us that longingness of eternity, the truth is that we don't always understand the way of God, especially, you know, how God thinks. Because again, according to that verse, but no one can discover the work of God has done from the beginning to end. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than ours. Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Be transformed. By renewing our minds, changing the way we think, changing the way we look at our life, changing the way we treat time, you know, and, and, and doing things in the favor of the gospel, Paul is encouraging all of us toward a paradigm shift, the way we live and treat our lives. He knew the urgency and importance of a paradigm shift towards godliness because he was once a Gentile. He was once a sinner like you and I who has no hope of salvation. And that is why one of his encouragements to us is to redeem our time because the days are evil. A paradigm shift to the unredeemable time. One morning, there was a uh, certain man who rushed into the bus station and uh, he asked the security, the security guy at the bus station, um, when, does the bu when does the 1035 bus leaves? And then the security guy answered him, well, 1035. So he looked around and the man was kind of puzzled. There was no bus in the bus station. And he asked the security guy, 1035, but my wa watch says 1030. And the city hall clock says 1033. So where's the bus? What time do I need to go to and look to for the bus station? And uh, the security guy said to him, you know, you can, you can look at any watch. You can go to at any clock that you want to, but you cannot ride the bus at 1035 because it already left. You have to go through the watch at the bus station watch. And it says right there, 10. 36. That's why the bus already left. You know, often we are so comfortable with our life, with our controlled life, preoccupied with so many things, you know, that we forget to align our mind with God. You know, we want God to follow our own time and follow your own schedule. We want God, Lord. I have no time. No. We, we, we want God to follow us. 
But when we go out there to the bus station and take our bus ride, we will only find out that the bus already left. You know, you, we can follow. You can follow any watch you want for time, but the ultimate watch belongs to God. Amen. Now, in Numbers uh, chapter 13 and chapter 14, there were 12 men. They were sent out to spies and look into the promised land, Canaan. And only Joshua and Caleb gave an accurate report. The 12, they gave a bad report about what they saw. And they terrified everybody. And Joshua and Caleb said, you know, let us go right now. Because the Lord is with us. The Lord will give us this victory. But the 10 said, no. They are so big, humongous, and they, are, they outnumber us. So everybody was so afraid. And Caleb and Joshua, they were encouraging, no, let us go today. Because this is what God wants us to do. God will give us the victory today. But they did not. Then the Lord was angry at them. The Lord was furious at them. So the 10, the 10 men who gave that bad report died instantly. And the people, they were all terrified with God. So early in the morning, they got up early in the morning, armed themselves, marching towards Canaan. And you know what? Joshua and God, no, don't go. Don't go. Because the Lord is not with you. Yesterday, the Lord is with us, but now the Lord is not with us. The Lord is angry at us. Don't go. You will just be defeated. But their, their stubborn heart, their stubborn head, they marched towards Canaan and they were defeated. You see? They were all defeated. Early in the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, now we are ready to go up to the land the Lord had promised. Surely we have sinned. Now they are ready. Lord, yesterday we are not ready. We want you to follow us. Lord, tomorrow we are ready. Then you have to follow us. People want, we want to follow God. We want God to bow down to our time, to bow down to what we want. We don't want to bow down in humility with God and follow God. You know, because the Lord is not with them, they were defeated. Now, unfortunately for them, when they march, the bus already left. You know, you know when the time that you are ready, brothers and sisters and those friends of ours that have not yet accepted the Lord, when the time that you are ready to take that ride on the bus, to take that ride with God, you might be surprised to see when you arrive at the bus station that the bus station is filled with so many people just like you with no buses because just like you, they are all late. They are all late in accepting the Lord Jesus Christ because the bus already left. Finally, in Luke chapter 12, 18 to 21, the paradigm shift to a drastic change right now. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build a bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. There is a time for everything. Remember, when you have your life here on earth, you control your life. But when you die, your life now belongs to God. You don't have any more control over your life when you die. God made everything beautiful. He made you beautiful. He made me handsome. Of course, that is according to my mom. My wife, my daughter, I don't know. 
You know, your, your, your creation is not by accident. It was planned by God. And you came at the right time. God has given you your time. However, all of time must come to an end. Our life, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, is a paradigm shift. We just need to make sure we are shifting to the right side of life where God is. Now, I will leave you all with this final verse to ponder upon. And if it seems evil, to, and if it seems evil, sorry, to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The choice is yours if you will stay with God or not. The choice is yours for those who have not yet accepted the Lord. To be without God or to be with God. To be saved and live eternally in heaven or to live eternally but in punishment in hell. The choice is yours. Yesterday, I just came to my mind again. I was talking with Brother Derek. And we have a good laugh about this. Do you want to talk about God right now? Do you want to talk about Jesus right now? Do you want to talk about who Jesus is? Or do you want to see Jesus now? I'll take the first option. Just like what I've always asked you, who wants to go to heaven? All of us wants to go to heaven, but who wants to go first? My dear brothers and sisters, and my dear friends, Please accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your life as long as you have the time. A paradigm shift about time. God bless everybody. Shall well stand as we sing the song of invitation.